Uh, okay, I think we'll get started now. I'm uh, conscious of uh, everyone's time. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Scott Henwood, and I'm the uh, Senior Director of Programs at Canary. And today we're going to be talking about our Cybersecurity Initiatives Program and uh, what it could mean for your organization. Uh, I'm joined by several colleagues today. Uh, I'll maybe uh, introduce them as, uh, as they uh, come, uh, come up to present. Uh, next slide, please, Christina. So we will be uh, recording this webinar. However, um, uh, since this webinar is uh, uh, view only for participants, you, your video and audio won't be recorded. Uh, we'll be asking questions by text and, and the questions won't be uh, recorded either. All right, next slide, please. Uh, so we're going to uh, break this section in uh, this uh, webinar into four parts today. Uh, I'll give you a quick overview of the program. We'll tell you how to participate. Uh, we have uh, our initiative partners uh, for our first three initiatives under this program who will be giving you some details and then a uh, Q&A at the end. Um, you, we'll, we'll try and keep the first two sections to 20 minutes and the third section to 20 minutes and hopefully that'll leave us uh, a lot of time for questions. Uh, speaking of questions, I'd like to direct your attention to the Q&A button at the uh, bottom of your Zoom toolbar. Uh, you can type your questions in there and we'll see them and, and we'll answer them at the end. Uh, there's also an interpretation uh, button on the, the lower toolbar as well. And so you can uh, uh, listen to uh, this presentation as is, or you can listen to it in English or French if you prefer. Okay, next slide, Christina. Um, so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on, on this slide for this audience. I'm, I'm sure you're all aware of the challenges uh, in securing a higher, a higher ed IT environment. Uh, the purpose of the Cybersecurity Initiatives Program is to fund and deploy initiatives that improve the cybersecurity posture of higher ed institutions in Canada. Uh, and we've designed this program in conjunction with the community with higher ed in mind, realizing that um, you have issues that are, are maybe unique and not normally found in, in the private sector. Uh, we also understand that uh, cybersecurity is not simply a technical problem, but that human factors and, and policy are also key to protecting the institution. So although we will have uh, technical initiatives, there'll be uh, other initiatives as well. Uh, we'll be taking our direction from the community and what's needed, but it seems likely that there'll be some initiatives in the future that concentrate on training, uh, sharing of best practices, uh, and things like that. Uh, also, because there's so much collaboration in this community, um, both in person in uh, the before times and hopefully in the future uh, and virtually now, we're in a situation where uh, we're only as strong uh, as our weakest link. And since um, you know, all the institutions are connected together through the national r &E network. One of the goals of, of this program is uh, to make sure that there are no weakest links and, and everybody has sort of the same cybersecurity posture. Uh, my colleague Catherine yesterday described it as everyone rising on the incoming tide, which I, I think is a, a, a good description. Uh, there's practical approaches, uh, practical advantages to a national approach as well, as we're procuring hardware and software services uh, training for the entire higher ed community. There's some cost savings due to economies of scale, and that allows us to uh, offer more, even more initiatives to the, the benefit of the community. Next slide, please. Um, just speaking of the national strategy, this is um, an image of the uh, National Research and Education Network. The institutions are represented by the blue dots. Uh, and as you can see, they're connected together by the r &E network. Um, just for completeness, I wanted to point out that uh, Canary has an internal IT or uh, internal cybersecurity department, sorry, and they're working with their colleagues at the, uh, the RANs, the network providers, uh, and they're taking care of uh, protecting the network and the infrastructure. So this program is specifically about uh, protecting the institutions connected to the network. Uh, next, please. This is probably most, the most important uh, slide in the presentation as you um, uh, participate in this program. Uh, there's a couple of terms that will come up again and again. Uh, the NREN is the National Research and Education Network, and that's the countrywide network implemented 
uh, by Canary and our provincial and territorial partners. Uh, collectively, Canary and our provincial uh, territorial partners are known as uh, NREN partners. An initiative partner is slightly different. Uh, an initiative partner is an organization, uh, CIRA or CANSOC, for example, who are responsible for uh, delivering initiatives under this program. Uh, in the future, an initiative partner could either, even be an NREN partner or, or Canary. Uh, and finally, uh, most of interest to you, an eligible organization. And this is a, a higher ed organization that's eligible to uh, participate and, and receive initiatives under the, this program. Next slide, please. So what does the cybersecurity initiatives program do? I mean, simply it funds and delivers initiative to strengthen uh, your security posture. Um, I touched on this before. Uh, initiatives uh, could include physical devices to help um, secure your network, uh, cloud services to help secure your users, uh, information about new and emerging threats, training, uh, and others. And others is here because we are uh, heavily consulting with the community on this through our advisory committees. And uh, it is entirely possible that the community going forward may identify uh, some initiatives that are of value but don't fit into any of these other categories. Next slide, please. So benefits to the organization, I mean, fairly obviously, uh, the, the first benefit would be that uh, your organization is uh, getting equipment or knowledge or services to uh, augment your cybersecurity infrastructure. Uh, for all our initiatives, we ask that you collect uh, metrics uh, once the initiatives are deployed, and uh, certainly they help us run the program, but there's an, also an opportunity uh, perhaps for you to use these metrics to understand uh, how these initiatives are uh, performing or uh, increasing the cybersecurity uh, posture of your institution. Um, as I mentioned before, initiative partners who will be implementing the initiatives are uh, sort of national experts in this area, you, you have an opportunity to work with them. And, uh, you know, perhaps through that there, you may discover something in the cybersecurity realm that's not uh, currently on your radar that should be. Uh, and finally, uh, increasing your team's uh, security capacity and expertise. Uh, certainly for initiatives that require it, we will be providing uh, training. Um, but, you know, there may be some initiatives that that we, uh, we don't fund because they're very specific to your institution. However, if um, you've participated in some of the other initiatives, you now have some internal expertise that can sort of uh, carry your cybersecurity uh, plans to the next step. Next slide, please. So initiative direct, uh, delivery, those of you who have uh, worked with Canary before on other programs, this is a little bit different uh, rather than Canary. Uh, delivering these initiatives directly. We'll be working with our NREN partners uh, and they will be the ones who will be taking the lead in working with the eligible organizations uh, to get you signed up and, uh, and get these implement, uh, initiatives uh, implemented. Uh, your NREN partner is the primary contract for joining the program uh, and requesting initiatives and, and for some initiative support. Uh, and of course, the Canary uh, cybersecurity team will be available for, for additional uh, support as required. Just to minimize the, uh, the bar uh, to entry for this program for the eligible organizations, uh, there's no direct cost to participate in the program or to access initiatives. Uh, for some initiatives, we uh, may ask that you make staff available for training or installation uh, and things like that. And there's also no accounting overhead for your organization. So the initiative partners are, are typically funded directly by Canary. Uh, next slide, please. A uh, really quick note on the program timeline. This program is uh, reasonably new officially. It was launched on November 30th, at which point we also announced our uh, first three initiatives, one of which, and we'll see that later, is, is ready for applicants today. Uh, we expect to launch two or three more initiatives over the next uh, two and a bit years, again, under the, the direction from the community through our advisory committees. And uh, you can uh, sign up to participate in, in any of these initiatives up to March 31st, 2023. And that will allow us, we'll continue delivery uh, through March 31st, 2024, which is the end of Canary's current funding mandate from the Government of Canada. 
but no worries, we will be working between 2023 and 2024 to sort of plan the, the evolution of the program uh, for 2024 and beyond. Next slide, please. Uh, so I've touched on this a few times, who, who determines the uh, funded initiatives uh, and uh, for this program, community engagement drives everything we do. Uh, we have a top level committee, the Cybersecurity Advisory Committee, and it consists of uh, leaders from uh, higher ed in Canada, as well as representatives and experts from the not-for-profit and, and private sectors. They advise us on the program direction in general and specifically on uh, initiatives. Uh, this is uh, a big program with lots of moving parts. So there are actually three standing committees and a working group under the CAC uh, who are responsible for technology, uh, implementation, uh, measures and metrics, uh, things like that. Next slide, please. Uh, so there are a few criteria that the uh, Cybersecurity Advisory Committee looks at. Um, when uh, deciding on initiatives, the first obviously is efficacy, like, you know, will this initiative actually make a difference? Will it help things? Uh, broad applicability, we would be unlikely to fund initiatives that only had value to one or two institutions. We're looking to uh, have the biggest impact as possible. Uh, time to deploy, there's, uh, you know, an initiative that takes three years to roll out is less attractive than, um, than one that can be rolled out in six months, everything else being equal. Uh, affordability, of course, you know, Canary's funding is not not limitless. We have to, uh, uh, you know, work on initiatives that provide the best value for money and sustainability. So, you know, an initiative uh, would not be particularly useful if it required you to dedicate multiple IT staff permanently to it, or if it was really expensive so that when the Canary funding was gone, everything, you know, sort of falls by the wayside. Uh, and of course, we also consider National coordination, can these initiatives allow the institutions across the country to work together to improve cybersecurity in general? And also, can we measure the impact of these initiatives? An initiative where we can't actually measure it is, is probably not worth uh, doing. Next slide, please. Uh, so we, we do have speakers today who will be addressing some of the technical details of the uh, first three initiatives, uh, the CIRA DNS firewall, the CANSOC threat feed, and the intrusion detection system, formerly the joint security project, and we'll, we'll get to those in a moment. Uh, but first, I'll uh, pass it over to my colleague, Laura Lamar, who is Canary's Program Operations Manager, and she's going to tell you how you can participate in the uh, Cybersecurity Infrastructure Program. Okay, thank you, Scott. So the eligibility criteria to participate in the CIP is that you must be connected to the NREN. You also must be a member of an organization of an NREN partner and connected to that NREN partner through an autonomous network. Uh, you must also be either a post-secondary institution, a non-federal research facility, or a center of excellence. Uh, we're working hard with our NREN partners to ensure that they know their list of EOs. So um, if you have any questions, you can reach out to them. Uh, to note, individual initiatives may have their own uh, eligibility criteria, but as they launch, that will be fully outlined, so you, you don't need to worry about it. it once they launch, it, it will be very clear, and you can, again, work with your NREN partner, or you can always contact CIP at canary.ca if you have any questions at all. Next slide, please. So for the participant obligations, uh, typically you will have to have some staff time set aside to be able to participate in the deployment and the operation of each of the initiatives. Um, you will be asked to contribute metrics through due March 2024 uh, for any of the initiatives deployed by your organization. Um, you will then be required to submit a short report after each initiative is deployed. And as Scott mentioned, uh, these, this type of data we take to feed into our future initiatives as well, so that we support you in all of the cybersecurity initiatives forthcoming. Next slide, please. So how do we participate? Well, uh, representatives from your provincial and territorial NREM partners will be inviting eligible organizations to participate in the CIP. 
If you haven't heard from them and you're not sure about your eligibility, please reach out to your NREN partner. And if you require um, the contact information for your NREN partner and you're not sure, we actually have a list of that under cybersecurity on our website. The eligible organizations will get a link from their NREN partner to submit a short participation form that comes right through to Canary. My team puts together the agreement for Canary and we will send it to you for execution. So that is the organization cybersecurity collaboration agreement, long name, so we call it the OCCA. So once that's executed, your NREN partner will provide you the instructions for the initiatives that are open at that time. And the good news is you only have to do one OCCA. It's your ticket to be involved in the CIP program as a whole, not for initiative. Next slide, please. So some of the questions that you might have that we put together is, do we have to implement all of the initiatives being provided by Canary? And no, you do not. You choose the initiatives that are best for your organization to support your cybersecurity planning. Another one is, are these initiatives intended to replace what we already have in place? No, they are definitely not. Uh, it's basically to support that baseline of cybersecurity technologies and processes and skills across the higher ed community of Canada. Uh, the CIP initiatives are intended to fill any type of gaps that exist with uh, supplementing tools and processes that you already have in place. Next slide, please. Is there a deadline to participate in the CIP? Participation it can happen at any time, but they can those initiatives can only be accessed once you have that OCCA uh, agreement in place with Canary. So once that's executed, you can access any of the initiatives that are have started. But to note, the sooner that you do participate, the longer that you can be part of these funded initiatives. The deadline to participate, as Scott mentioned, for the funded initiatives right now is March 31st, 2023, and that funding goes until March 31st, 2024. So our organization is already using a CNS, uh, sorry, a CIRA DNS firewall. How can we benefit from the program's funding? Well, the good news is that you already have it, and all you have to do is uh, complete that participation form from your NREN partner, submit it to Canary, and we execute that agreement with you. And then you are actually benefiting already from Canary funding as of January 1st, 2021. Next slide, please. And the first three initiatives that Scott mentioned, I'll give it back to you, Scott. Okay, um, thank you, Laura. Um, Yes, yeah, so we'll, we'll at this point, and we're right on time, which is great, we'll get uh, our initiative partners to uh, sort of describe uh, uh, their uh, initiatives. And up first is Mark Gaudet, the product manager for cybersecurity at CIRA. And Mark's going to talk about the DNS firewall. Thanks, Scott. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, yeah, I'll give you a quick overview and try to anticipate some of the questions you'll have for the DNS firewall. So. DNS is used by every device, every application on the network, and that provides a level of visibility into what's happening. Uh, you can see all of the legitimate DNS queries or, or for good use, and you can also get visibility on to clicks to phishing links, um, to infected sites. You can see the command and control for botnets um, if there are botnets operating inside the network. So it provides a high level of visibility. So the DNS firewall, what it does is it looks at all of the DNS queries coming out of your network, compares them to multiple threat feeds, and allows or blocks them. And what that does specifically is prevent users from accessing known infected sites, uh, phishing sites, and disables botnets um, at the command and control level for DNS. And most applications are using, uh, malware is using, is using DNS at some level. Even the solar winds um, um, that you've heard about, the, the breach of the US government, that malware was distributed as product updates for solar wind. 
but once that malware is operated, it did do command and control DNS reach outs to specific uh, domains. So you could disable it at that level. If we go to the next next slide. Uh, so right now we're we're there's 50 over 50 universities, colleges, uh, CJEPs, research networks using uh, the service among you know another three to four hundred customers. Uh, we're protecting more than two million users, uh, lots of K to 12s, um, higher ed plus uh, businesses, um, municipalities, more than 100 cities in Canada. So uh, the service has been in market for um, over three years. Um, it, we're positioning, it's positioned as an incremental layer of defense. So it's not going to replace your physical firewall or your antivirus or anything you're doing but add an additional layer. Um, the big value, or we, we partnered, we see Akamai as part of the, the sources of blocks on the right. Uh, we've partnered with Akamai and we're using their software. So Sierra owns and operates the DNS servers. Uh, we operate the control configuration and reporting software. It's all hosted in Canada. Um, the servers are on bare metal in our data centers and the control software operates in AWS. Um, the value that Akamai brings is, is the threat feed and data. So they see roughly 3% of all global DNS queries plus 30% of all web traffic um, by operating recursive DNS in, in large ISPs and operating a CDN network. Um, I'll talk a little bit more detail on the next slide about the threat feed. Uh, or actually in a couple slides, but just where one the vision for the DNS firewall is to create it. It, it provides that incremental layer of protection for any uh, organization that uses it, but it also creates the opportunity to build an ecosystem around the DNS, um, the DNS firewall, both the threat feed, threat data, um, the threat landscape data, as well as the DNS data. So organizations at the bottom, I'm just showing the CANSOC founding members as an example, but sending DNS queries to the DNS firewall, um, there's different threat feeds applied. So one of them is CANSOC. So right now we are, we have incorporated the CANSOC threat feed. Um, anything that's added there will be instantly blocked by the DNS firewall service um, as well. There is visibility into everything that's blocked. So um, looking at it nationally across higher ed, we have a really good view from the DNS firewall of what the threat landscape is, what kind of botnets are operating, uh, what type of infected sites, uh, specific phishing sites that are targeting higher ed. And, and the, what's it's fascinating to look at this data and that it's it's really dynamic and what it changes day to day, week to week, in which threats are peaking, um, new threats showing up. So we have the, the blocking, the view on the threat landscape. Uh, we also have a rich set of data. So we do store every DNS query and response plus every block, and that goes into a data store. And it's going to create the opportunity to do research at some of the uh, cyber centers at different universities. Right now we're doing some research projects with CIC at the University of New Brunswick. So um, analyzing DNS data to identify new threats, uh, looking for phishing um, domains that might be closely matched to a university or college's name. Um, and then being able to feed more data into CANSOC to help them identify new threats and, and taking their threat feed. So go to the next slide, please. Uh, some of the architecture highlights. So the service is any casted, which means we, we pair sites uh, for redundancy. So you'll get routed at the BGP level or IP level to the closest site. Um, Toronto and Calgary are, are linked together or actually appear as one IP address. Uh, Montreal and Vancouver are also um, clouded together or any casted and appear as a single IP. We also have some private servers hosted inside risk. So 
there is some uh, content inside the risk network that um, we are on their IP addressing. So you'll, if you're using um, pointing to those servers, then you can access some privately hosted content inside the risk network. Um, it's a high performance carrier grade software. So combined, we can answer millions of queries per second. Um, and very, very good uh, speed. So doing the comparison against the threat feed doesn't, doesn't really introduce any latency. Our response time across Canada is, is below 30 milliseconds. Uh, typically, um, we're answering yeah, billions and billions of queries. So we've got a really good view of that from that data of what the threat landscape is, as well as um, what applications are being used. I can go to the next slide, please. Um, Akamai, what, what we are adding, uh, no matter what kind of security products you have in, or in place right now, is an incremental layer of protection. And the reason that is, is because Akamai is providing a threat feed that's from a different source with different timing um, from things that you're already using. So Akamai has a lot of ISP customers globally that provide an anonymized feed of global DNS data into their data science center. So um, they're looking at a million plus DNS queries per second, second coming into their data science. They're doing one of the areas they focus on the most is newly seen domains. So they keep track of every domain that's been queried for the past 60 days. And if they see a domain for the first time, then it's analyzed and would be added to the block list in minutes. So it started like within 14, 15 minutes, um, that domain from being seen for the first time globally hits the block list. So they do some of their own data science, plus they also have 37 other threat feeds. So um, commercially, some, they use Sophos plus a bunch of other threat feeds. So they'll do machine learning on DNS queries, cluster them, and then look at things like domain reputation, um, look at the IPs they resolve to if they're on another threat feed, and they can instantly block that whole cluster. So that's one of the advantages of doing threats at the DNS level is you don't really have to do a deep dive initially into what the threat is and the characteristics, a hash of a, a file. You can instantly block a domain by association. And even though they're doing that, there isn't, uh, they don't have an issue of false positives. So their solution is targeted at carriers like a Rogers um, or in the US, Cox and Comcast are two of their customers for this type of solution. So they need to have a high confidence level. So we, we don't see false positives uh, very often. It's pretty rare. Even with a couple million users, it's, it, the number is very small maybe one, one to two a week would be uh, the most we would see. We go to the next slide. Um, just the, the product has a very simple web dashboard. So on this, you can see at the bottom of graph, the volume of DNS queries. Um, you can see what's blocked by web filter. That means it, it also supports content filtering, which isn't done very much in higher ed. Um, then the middle one, the red is, uh, blocked by botnets, uh, uh, sorry, blocked by, these would be blocks to phishing or um, infected sites. And then on the right is botnets. So this would be malware, machine generated DNS queries coming from malware that might be inside the network. Um, you, the, the, the product, uh, if a user clicks on a phishing URL or an infected site, then they will see a customized block page. Um, there's an API for um, to access that data as well. We go to the, the next slide, please. Um, very simple to set up. So uh, you would for keep your internal DNS servers. So uh, typical configuration would have active directory inside the network, forward the DNS queries to the DNS firewall, um, and, and we would answer those queries uh, on your behalf and compare them to the threat feed. And up show a custom, there is a proxy server as well. So in order to serve up the block page, if a user clicked on a uh, an infected site, 
the DNS server would answer back with the IP address of the proxy server, and then the user's HTTP traffic would go to uh, the proxy server and serve up a block page. Uh, next slide. Oh. So just the way to get access would be complete the form as has been described earlier in the webinar. And then if we click again, we'll get the next uh, is um, we identify customers by the source IP of the DNS queries or the HTTP traffic. So within the user interface, you would configure the IPs that we'll see traffic from. So you can have multiple networks or uh, configured. Uh, you would customize your block pages. So if a user got a block page, they would know how to contact you or who to contact if on the off chance it was a, a false positive. And then you can also configure content filtering or, um, and configure which uh, threat feeds you want to add. So CANSOC will be enabled for all Canary members uh, you participating. Um, and you can select that to be enabled, but by default, it's the Akamai threat feed. Uh, there's a CCCS threat feed, which is also incorporated into CANSOC. Um, and then if we click again, we'll get the, the last one would be to turn on or to forward the DNS, do a configuration change and forward the DNS queries to us. So we have two IPs for redundancy and most of the forwarders would send a one and fail over to the second. Uh, next slide. And yeah, I'm, I'm done. So uh, I think that's, I've used up my time. So let's I'll pass it off to you, Jill, and uh, I'm happy to answer any questions at the end. Okay, uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, just a reminder to ask your questions in the using the Q and A uh, button at the uh, lower okay. Zoom to toolbar. And up next, next is Jill Kowalchuk, who's the uh, director at CANSOC, and she'll be talking about the CANSOC threat feed. Thanks, Scott. Uh, so I know a few of you on the call uh, attended yesterday's uh, executive level seminar, so I won't spend too much time providing um, the background, but as there's a number of new members, I'll just give a quick overview. So CANSOC is not an independent organization, but instead it's a collaboration between a group of institutions. It started with a, a smaller group that Mark mentioned in, in one of his slides with the intent to explore and understand um, how we could build uh, shared security, uh, shared security operation center together. We're eager now that we've um, grown beyond that. And so uh, membership is now open to the broader post-secondary community, including all universities, colleges, polytechniques and research institutes, all of whom Laura, Laura mentioned are eligible as part of the, the CIP program. If your institution does sign on to the threat feed, then we would consider your institution part of the, the a member in CANSOC. And so we're looking forward to expanding our membership and, and working with more institutions. So CANSOC's mission is better than we can do on our own, always in partnership. And so we're very much focused on how can we bring together um, different organizations to support and develop initiatives to better, to better serve the community. As you can see in the image, we are just one of these pieces. Um, Canary, the NREN partners, CIRA, and others are all integral part of how this comes together. Next slide. So from a CANSOC perspective and many others in the space, we use the NIST framework uh, to support our cybersecurity discussions. Um, as many of you know, NIST outlines five key areas that you can see here on the slide. From our perspective, we're really focused on detection and response. Um, and, and how can we work together to um, work with other partners and organizations in the space, to leverage other existing investments and initi initiatives within the DR space to make detection and response better. As many of you know, this is a really big challenging area uh, for all organizations, but in particular for our sector given the complexity. And so this is where we're focusing our efforts as we move forward. Next slide. In terms of detection and response, um, we're also focused on operational coordination. So when you look at organizations, other organizations in the space like Canary and, and Cuccio and others, they also support the coordination effort. CANSOC is a bit unique in that we're really focusing on, on this from a uh, detection and response again, and again on operational coordination. And so 
in a little bit more detail, what we mean there is many organizations out there, um, some of you might be working with your NREN partner on the SIM deployment project. Uh, some of you might be working um, or signed up to the Canadian Centre for Cybersecurity and receive alerts. Perhaps you signed up for Aventel, which is um, the Cyber Centre is also CCCS, what Mark mentioned in terms of their, their threat feed. Um, we also are working closely with global partners who have additional threat intelligence. From a CANSOC perspective, we're looking at how can we leverage these existing initiatives, bring these pieces together, and provide um, more effective support and services to the, to the sector that is focused on the, the, the unique needs of the higher education sector. And so when we think about this in the context of threat feed, um, CANSOC threat feed isn't you know, a unique independent feed, it is an open source platform that pulls in some of these other um, existing feeds, consolidates them and makes it easier for institutions uh, to consume. Next slide. So I'm gonna spend uh, my, my last remaining minutes focusing a little bit more on threat feed. And so in this picture, it provides a very basic overview of what uh, the threat feed is. Threat feed is just one component that CANSOC is looking at, but it is the first one that we're looking to launch. And we're really excited to be able to do that as part of the Canary CIP program in partnership with CIRA um, and looking forward to leveraging that on the IDS side as well. In terms of threat intelligence sources, or to start with, threat feed is essentially open source technologies that allows us to pull in different um, feeds and, and information and provide it out to um, institutions or members in, in a variety of different ways. And so we can provide that threat feed out as you can log into our platform and manually consume that information. There's a lot of information there, so it's probably a, a challenge to consume it that way. We can provide it out in, in Sticks Taxi um, or via URL or other automated ways so that you can easily ingest that into devices and, and use it in a simple way. So what you see on the left is the threat intelligence sources um, that we currently have. So we uh, ingest the Canadian Centre for Cybersecurity, that Aventail feed, um, and include that as part of ours. Um, that feed is open to any institution uh, that would like to sign up for it. The advantage of signing up for it or signing up to CANSOC is that you receive this as well as other um, sources of intelligence in one consolidated, um, curated form of intelligence. We also have um, acquired, purchased a commercial feed um, and have licensed that in a way where we can share it out to all um, institutions that participate. So this allows you to get one of these really high quality um, feeds without having to everybody go off and pay for it on their own. In this case, we're fortunate that Canary is paying for it on our behalf. We also um, bring in uh, sources of intelligence from partner institutions. So we do this in a few ways. First is institutions will contact us um, in confidence when they have seen potentially been compromised and indicate indicators that they have seen in this. We've seen this a few times recently over the last few months. We then take those indicators, um, look up in our feed to see, are they already being reported by um, CCCS or our commercial partner or others? And if not, we add that intelligence, we can, auto we can support institutions automatically blocking off of that. Um, as part of the, the partner institutions, some provide us automated feedback, uh, automated intelligence that we curate. And as Mark noted, we're looking to work with um, CIRA to see the intelligence that, that they get out of the DNS firewall and ensure that is included um, in terms of a, a higher priority of something that should be blocked against. And then we also curate open source intelligence and manually add it. We've seen recently with, with one institution that we recently engaged with to onboard, the advantage of the CANSOC side is when the riot virus hit a few weeks ago and was hitting the, the hospital sector and then the academic sector, and there was different open source indicators put out by Mandiant and others. CANSOC's analysts took all of those indicators, put it into the threat feed, saving each and every institution that wanted to block against that from having to do that manually. In terms of how institutions can consume um, this intelligence, we've set it up in a, in a wide range uh, of ways. And so when you look at the, the devices you see on the right, it, you could think of it as a little bit of a spectrum in terms of ease of integration. So at the bottom, you have DNS firewall. Um, in this case, we're excited to par partner with CIRA through the Canary program on this. And so if you would like to use the CANSOC firewall, the CANSOC threat feed in your DNS firewall when you sign up with CIRA, 
it will be provided as an option. Uh, Sierra has done all of the integration work and all you need to do is check the button. Uh, so it's perhaps two minutes of work. If you'd also like to take the threat feed and protect it, uh, use it in your next gen firewall, uh, then you would engage with us and we would uh, provide you with the support to um, integrate our block list into your firewall in an automated fashion. If you do this in, in that way, you can set it up so that your firewall blocks all of the traffic identified as malicious from the CANSOC threat feed and prevents it from even getting to your network. Uh, this would take approximately two to three hours of work from a technical person on your end. And once that work and integration is done, um, it is very much a set it and forget it. We're also looking to work with the IDS program around providing our threat feed to be able to leverage um, in the, the tools and technologies that you'll hear about next. And for those institutions which have um, infrastructure and or um, analysts on site that, that curate and manage their own threat intelligence and their own threat intelligence platform, you can consume ours into that platform so that you can minimize the amount of work you need to do on, on curating and adding the, the threat intelligence that CanSoc has already curated. So last slide, I'll only spend a couple more minutes um, and just uh, next slide. Uh, highlight uh, how would you take advantage of, of threat feed. Similar to all the other programs, you sign the, the Canary Agreement. Um, and once that is signed and your institution is ready, if you're moving forward with um, the DNS firewall, to, um, you'll automatically see that as an option and you can select it. If you'd also like to move forward and, and use the threat feed in some of your other devices on, on campus, then we would send you a non-disclosure agreement this agreement is quite basic. It's based off of the Canadian Center for Cybersecurity uh, Agreement and essentially just says that you agree not to reshare this information. Uh, this is a requirement for us for that feed as well as for our commercial feed, um, but it is pretty basic and straightforward. It also allows if your institution wants, you have the ability to share back with us in confidence um, intelligence. And if you give us written approval, we will ingest that into our threat feed and anonymize it and or share out alerts depending upon the intelligence. We would then set up a one hour technical onboarding meeting depending upon where you're located and our partnership with the NREN partner that might be provided by the, the your, your provincial partner. So Orion's providing that support as well as Cybera and potentially others in the future. Uh, and if and or um, a CANSOC technical representative would support you directly. And then following that, if you're looking to integrate it into your um, next gen firewall on campus, it would be about two to three hours of, of effort to do that. If you receive your firewall support and services from a third party like Cybera or RISC or others, then we can work with those organizations uh, so that they can do the work for you. Uh, so Scott, I'll pass it off. All right, thank you, Jill. Uh, so next up is Dr. Murad Dababi. He's the interim uh, dean of the School of Engineering and Computer Science at Concordia. He's going to be uh, talking about the intrusion detection system. But what Dr. Dababi doesn't know is we added a slide this morning. So I'll maybe do that one first. Um, next slide, please, Christina. Uh, so this is just some some details on the uh, on the program itself. So in this case, the eligible organizations are. Uh, uh, EOs who have not uh, participated, participated in, in the joint security project before, uh, and they will receive a, an appropriate server with uh, Zeek software, two network taps, uh, training for staff, and there's 15K uh, available uh, uh, for your IT staff to uh, install, configure, and uh, maintain this equipment. Uh, uh, technical support via Slack channel and a documentation portal will be delivered by your NREN partner and Canary. And for current uh, JSP participants, uh, you'll continue to have analysis platform access and Dr. DeBobby will be talking about analysis platforms uh, and benefit from these improvements. And you can also enroll in training sessions. Uh, and with that, over, over to you, Dr. DeBobby. Next slide, please, Christina. Thank you so much, uh, Scott. I, I believe that my most relevant title is director of the Cybersecurity Research Center at Concordia University. And uh, uh, indeed, this is uh, an exciting project, uh, um, maybe one of the most exciting projects that I, I, I am participating in. And I'd like to thank Canary for their leadership in bringing together the academic institu institution to share uh, security-related information, uh, which is the main purpose of this project, 
uh, aggregate this information, subject the information to uh, uh, security analytics. And the main purpose behind that is to generate uh, timely threat intelligence that is actionable that people can use to uh, either prevent or detect or and, and mitigate uh, threats that they see on their uh, academic networks. Uh, second, uh, we would like to give as much as we can in terms of attributes of the Intel, but in addition, we would like to characterize the Intel, uh, uh, in the Intel, the, the threat severity by providing some, some metrics uh, on how severe is the threat by looking at how it correlates with the uh, malicious infrastructure or to other threats that we have seen. Uh, this is basically to, to assess the underlying risk and allow the institution to apply the right mitigation and to uh, establish priorities or where to act and when to act and on which threat. Uh, uh, a downstream objective, a very important sub goal is to uh, track not only the threats, but also the trends and the threat actors and the, what infrastructure they are using in terms of uh, IPs, name servers, the domains and so on. And to try to see also patterns, to see correlations with other threats. And more importantly, also to benchmark their security against uh, what we see on other Canadian uh, networks in terms of threats and also to see how well they are doing over time. So these are the main objectives of the IDS or the former JSP initiative. Next slide, please. So in terms of architecture, we get uh, 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 data from uh, connection data for the time being, but we can, there are plans to get more in the future. So we get connection data uh, from uh, Zeek uh, sensors that are deployed within uh, each institution. And these, are, these data are shared through uh, a secure uh, tunnel with, uh, and they land uh, on our servers. We aggregate the data, we share it with another aggregation uh, center. So we have two aggregation centers where analytics and, uh, is taking place, uh, the servers at Concordia University and the servers as well as University of Waterloo. So uh, the uh, collected data is aggregated, subjected to security analytics. We generate Intel, we populate the Intel in, in portals and each institution has access to their own portal that gives them the Intel that is relevant to their network. Uh, but in addition, they have access to a second portal where we see, uh, where they see insights on what's happening on the Canadian academic networks without disclosing the specifics of each institution. So we do it in a, in a privacy preserving way. So we share uh, statistic, descriptive statistics on what we see in terms of threats. That way you see if you are, only, uh, the, you are the only institution targeted by a particular threat or it is something that we have seen and how often and when in other institutions without disclosing the names. Uh, next uh, slide, please. So the uh, uh, current platform uh, implement many capabilities uh, so uh, that, uh, that uh, address the uh, objectives that I mentioned before. So one of the capabilities that we have is to fingerprint any malicious traffic. So the, how this is done, we take the metadata, the meta information that is collected from the uh, Zeek sensors, and we align this data with uh, the uh, uh, patterns uh, in terms of network behavior that we see on uh, on on uh, on malware that that is collected so we 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 have uh, we collect malware feeds that that are executed in a sandbox and we know the 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 patterns of their uh, uh, netflow patterns and we use machine learning we use uh, 350 features we use the an ensemble of many machine learning techniques uh, some of them are classical machine learning techniques, but others are deep neural networks. We use both and we try to fingerprint what connections are malicious and we report Intel on those connections that are deemed as malicious. And as I mentioned before, we also provide uh, a sense on the severity of this connection, malicious connection. Second, we do also uh, use uh, extensively machine learning to do, uh, uh, to do anomaly detections. In this case, the, the, the uh, data set what we use is benign connections and, and any deviation from any benign uh, behavior will be flagged as anomaly. And again, it comes with the underlying Intel. 
Uh, last capability, uh, third capability, uh, we don't just uh, flag uh, malicious connections or anomalous connections, but in addition, we look into self-correlation. So if we see, for example, that two threads uh, have the same attributes, the, 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 they exhibit some correlation, then we will deem them as a campaign. This means that there is evidence of orchestration or there is evidence of coordination of these threads. It's coming basically from the same source. So it's not just one attack that is isolated against one organization, but is a coordinating, coordinated uh, campaign against many institutions. So we do also uh, campaign detection by leveraging machine learning and uh, some graph theoretic techniques. Uh, another capability that uh, we, we, we provide is that we watch the mapping between the IP addresses and domain. So if we see, for example, that uh, uh, legitimate IP is pointing to a bad domain or a domain that is not within the usual domains of the institution, we will flag that. It might be a violation of policy or it might be an indication that that particular machine or that particular IP address has been compromised. Uh, we similarly, if there is any good domain that is pointing to bad IP, we will also flag that. And uh, in doing this, we leverage a passive DNS stream and a database of, uh, of uh, 50 billions or so of records uh, of passive DNS in order to, to flag those, uh, those anomalous mappings between domain and IP addresses. And actually, we can do even much more th 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 than that uh, in terms of uh, analysis of, uh, of uh, the uh, DNS aspect of the connections. Uh, next, we generate as well the reports. Uh, uh, we populate the intel in the portals, but in addition, we produce reports at the needed frequency. It can be weekly, it can be monthly, it can be even daily if needed. The reports are not meant to be a replica of the portal. They are meant to be uh, information uh, that track uh, the security over time, uh, that benchmark the security against what we see on the Canadian networks to give insights to managers or executives that are managing the security within the academic institution. Uh, also, we, we did a lot of playing with the uh, sticks and taxi, and uh, if there is a need, we can share Intel in other ways other than portals and reports. Next, please, slide. Uh, we have a capability by which we do uh, an extensive analysis of uh, uh, open services that present some vulnerabilities uh, when, by comparing uh, uh, what we see uh, on the open services with uh, uh, the common vulnerabilities and exposures, the CVEs at NIST. So if we see any vulnerable service, then we will flag this as well. We do an analysis of the seek notice, uh, notice notices or alerts. And uh, uh, also, as I mentioned, one of the most important objectives of this initiative is try to uh, uh, bridge the gap in terms of security metrics. Try to give uh, some uh, measure of the security posture of uh, the institution and also try to provide some insight on how severe the threats that we see are. So in, uh, in essence, so that's, that's a wonderful project. As I mentioned, we are very excited, uh, excited in doing this project in collaboration with uh, Canary and the, and the partner uh, participating institutions. And uh, we, we look forward for your active participation. And as I mentioned, the primary intent is to have some uh, uh, strong impact on the security operations of academic institution. Thank you. All right, thank you, uh, Dr. Dababi. Uh, so uh, Q&A now, we're running a little bit over time, but we can, we can certainly stay on uh, as necessary to make sure that uh, uh, all your questions get answered. There's a few very technical questions in the um, very specific technical questions and uh, uh, we might suggest that you contact us afterward and we'll, we'll put you in, in uh, uh, contact with the development team where it's appropriate for those. Um, we've answered some of them online, but I think it's uh, useful to go over some of these. Uh, so the first one was uh, from slide 15 is what, and that's eligibility, what is meant by an autonomous network. Uh, an autonomous network, um, in, in this case, an institution uh, would have to have their own IT infrastructure and not be relying on a host university or other organization for their IT services. Um, 
does Sierra DNS support SSL TLS DNS? And the answer is yes. Uh, do you have an alternative way to submit the information that you have tried to collect through the SurveyMonkey form you sent prior to this meeting through the provincial NREN? Uh, and uh, Laura's response is there is uh, currently no alternative way to, uh, to complete the participation form. It, it has to be done through uh, SurveyMonkey. Um, but uh, please contact us uh, at CIP at canary.ca if you're having uh, problems with the form and we'll be happy to, uh, to help out. Uh, is your DNS firewall able to detect ephemeral domains created or deleted by robots? Um, yeah, that's, I think, that's I think I'll let you pass that one off to you, Mark. <laughs> I'll, I'll give it back to you, Scott. <laughs> Actually, um, I, I wasn't, I'm not 100% sure if, if they're referring to algorithmic, uh, DGAs, algorithmically generated domain names, and the answer is yes. Uh, they're in Akamai's threat feed and they precede the threat feed. Uh, with most of the DGAs. Um, if it's something else, then I'd be happy if you follow up with me, I'd be ha happy to check with Akamai and, and verify. Okay, uh, that one is specific. So we'll go back to the open questions now. Um, I don't see any other uh, uh, open questions except for the very specific technical ones, and I'll, uh, I'll refer you to that, that the initiative partners uh, for some of those. Uh, is there anything else? Oh, here's a new one. What size of organization is recommended for investing in the IDS server and Zeek integration? Would an organization with 1,500 or less students be appropriate? Um, I do not believe we have any rules and organizations uh, size. The, uh, the goal is to, uh, um, as I mentioned before, elevate the cybersecurity posture of all the institutions and, and certainly IDS would be part of that. So the answer would be yes. Yes, it would benefit you. Uh, another question, can we partner with Canary directly or have to go through the higher ed space? Uh, for this program, uh, it would be through the, uh, the connecting NREN uh, and we, we, uh, we at Canary will be working in the background to, to support our NREN partners. Any other questions? Scott, I can take some of the JSP questions. Okay. So is Concordia runs this against their own university production data? I, Concordia is committed to deploy a sensor. It is going to be one of the institutions deploying this. For the time being, we are the aggregation center, but we, will, we are also going to be a participating institutions I have a commitment from our CIO to deploy a sensor and to subject also the connections at Concordia to analytics. Uh, the other question from Patrick, does this IDS ingest identities and the resource users and computers? No, the only data that we uh, ingest as of now is the Zeek uh, logs and in particular, just the connection data from the time being, which is metadata. In the future, uh, we are also ing ingesting uh, notices. In the future, we might ingest uh, other uh, input from uh, the Zeek logs, like either HTTP or DNS and so on. But for the time being, just notices and connections. Uh, how is authentication and authorization is done? So we have, uh, we pay special care to cyber security for the platform. So we have uh, a firewall uh, that is uh, an IDS. Uh, we, have, we have access control lists as well. We have a reverse proxy. The connections are done through SSH accounts. We just authorize connections from the IP of the participating institution, the designated IP. Uh, we have uh, portals uh, on, on the Kibana dashboard. Uh, and in Elasticsearch, we have different indexes and we have uh, role-based access control as well. 
and we have rootless containers. So we pay strict attention to the security of the platform. Uh, is connection data before or after local firewalls? If I'm not mistaken, the ZIC uh, sensors are behind the far firewall, they have deployed behind the firewall. Another question is the, the machine learning supervisor and supervised. I think we do both. Uh, we use uh, classifiers, for example, that, you, that are supervised machine learning, like XGBoost, Random Forest, LightGBM, CatBoost, Convolution Neural Networks. And we use as well uh, unsupervised machine learning for uh, specifically for uh, campaign detection and anomaly detection, one class SVM, isolation forest, uh, and, and other techniques as well. So both techniques are used. So we have a very detailed report uh, that is uh, close to 50 pages that details the specifics of machine learning, the accuracy, and so on, um, the features and, and, and everything. So we might make that report available in the near future after polishing slightly the report. All right, uh, thank you. Um, seeing uh, no other questions, I, I think we'll leave it uh, there for today. So I'd like to uh, thank my Canary colleagues, Laura and Christina, uh, for, for helping make this happen. Uh, certainly our uh, initiative partners, Dr. Dababi, uh, Jill and Mark. Uh, and thank all of you, uh, thanks to all of you for attending. Uh, very exciting. And uh, I look forward to your participation in the program. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you so much, Scott. Thanks, Scott. Thank you. Bye, everybody.